Thank you for that singing. Tonight we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And we're going to be finishing up the book of 1 Thessalonians. We've been at it all year so far. And we're going to hit the last passage of Scripture tonight. While you're finding your spot there, I did want to give some encouraging news. I got a text from the one of the detectives here at the sheriff's department last night. He told me that they had uh, had in custody our church burglar. And uh, thankfully, the hard work of the deputies and all of that have paid off. And uh, some of you, I don't know if you saw, we were on TV on Washington's Most Wanted. There was a little clip of our church and me kind of explaining where the guy came in and things. And they wanted to get just the guy's face out there and name. So i um, thankful for the hard work of many of those folks. And um, let's pray. The, guy, the, the man's name is Scott Waterbury, and uh, he is a 10-time felon, I guess. I don't know if all of them are felonies, but uh, he needs some help. He needs a change in his life, and uh, what he needs is the Lord. Let's, let's just be thinking and praying for him. Uh, the Bible said, let him that stole steal no more. That's the difference that Christ can make in a life. And uh, he's had plenty of opportunities, what he, and none of them have worked. What he needs is the Lord. So let's, let's just keep him in prayer. And I'm thankful that, uh, like I said, the, the police department and folks were able to apprehend him. And uh, fortunately, the Lord really watched over us. And uh, we were able to recover all of our stuff. If there's anything missing, I don't know it. Uh, everything that I can think of um, is accounted for. And so I'm, I'm grateful for how he's watched over us. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. We're going to look there in verse number 19 and read down through verse number 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, it says this, Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Let's pray and let's ask the Lord's blessing as we study this passage of Scripture that he'll give us understanding. Father, we're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful that we can gather tonight and for uh, your, your word that is faithful. I pray that you would just give us understanding as we study it. I pray that you would give us insight into what you intend for us. Help us to have faith and believe it as we study this passage, as we hear it and uh, expound it. I pray that we would mix faith with it, Lord, that we would be doers and not hearers only. Help our hearts to be stirred. Help our um, minds to be engaged and help us to be humble, Lord, that we would uh, respond to the working of your Holy Spirit in our lives. Father, we're thankful that you have given us your word and we're thankful for a church that we can gather together as believers. I pray that you would just bless this time. Give us your presence, Lord. I pray that it would work mightily in our midst. I pray for Scott Waterbury, Lord. Thank you that he was um, able to be apprehended. He's no longer necessarily a threat to the community, Lord. I pray that you would uh, do a work in his life. I pray that you would help him to uh, come across someone that will share the gospel with him, that would plant the seed of truth. And Father, he is in, in, in a lot of wickedness. Uh, no greater than any of ours, though, and, and Lord, there's no reason. Even Paul said he was the chief of sinners. So I pray that you'd do a work in this man's life. I pray that you would, God, send someone, uh, whether that even be uh, myself or someone from our church, to uh, share the truth with him. And I pray that you would do a, a pull him to you, Lord, guide him to you, and uh, I pray that your will would be done. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Tonight, I'm going to start kind of, I'm going to start at the end, I'm going to work backwards. Normally, we kind of start at the beginning of our passage and work through that. And today, I'm going to start at the end and then kind of back up a little bit. So look, look with me there again in verse number 23, where Paul writes to them and he says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. God intends for us to change. Paul prays for the believers in Thessalonica, and he prays with intention, understanding that God's plan for them is that they would be sanctified, that they would be conformed to the image of Christ, that that understanding would be fully realized in their lives. 
As we went through the book of 1 Thessalonians, we saw in chapter number 4 where it says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. God intends for us to be changed. He demands that our lives be purified. We are to become new creatures. That means there are behaviors that are to be shed as we put off the old man. There are to be new behaviors that are adopted as we uh, put on the new man. And in verse number 23, we understand this incorporates all of our being, our, our body, our soul, our spirit, every part of us. I, I don't, don't want to stop and park too long here because we've looked at it recently, but we are three-part beings. Our body is where we think and feel. That, that's, this is what has our five senses. And our body is what allows us to interpret the world around us. Our soul is the immaterial part of our being. That's our personality. That's our, our mind. This is where we feel our emotions. And then our spirit is, according to the scriptures, our spirit is dead before salvation. It is dead in trespasses and sins, and it becomes alive. It's quickened when we get saved. Our spirit, then, is what allows us to sense or have a consciousness of God. The Holy Spirit of God speaks to our spirit, and that's what allows us to hear his voice. And so we're these three-part beings. God uses all of them, and he speaks to our soul through his spirit. The end goal of all of this, we understand from verse 23, is sanctification. It's that when we are presented before Christ, we've talked a lot about uh, in First Thessalonians about the coming, the return of Christ, the parousia of Jesus, when he will come back and the rapture being a part of that. When we are presented to him at his coming, at this parousia, that we would be presented as blameless, it says there in verse 23, that we would be without sin. We as the church are the bride of Christ. We are espoused to him. That, that's the idea of engaged to him. Uh, we are promised to Jesus Christ, and at his return, we will be united to him. Jesus, when he returns, will receive his bride, the church. Then we will be ever with him, the scripture says. We will be with him as his bride. Ephesians 5 and verse 25, it says this, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. We as the church, as the bride of Christ, are to be preparing for the upcoming marriage of the Lamb. When we are united with Christ, we as his bride are to be prepared and, and that is entailing being sanctified, being cleansed by the water, that we would, as we are presented to him, we wouldn't be with spot, we wouldn't be with wrinkle, but we would be holy. I obviously am a man, if you can't tell, I'm sure you can tell. Um, when I got married, we, that wedding day, I didn't spend the whole day preparing because I'm a man, I don't have to. And so my preparations probably started about an hour before I was supposed to be at the church. I showered and got my, got my suit on, and I didn't spend all day. My wife, on the other hand, it was completely different, right? Those of you wives know. You've got to get your hair done. You've got to get your nails done. You've got to get everything proper. The preparation for that uh, wedding time where you're going to be presented to your husband and become his bride, become his wife. There's preparation that needs to take place. Well, we are to understand when Jesus returns, and we, we understand from 1 Thessalonians, that could happen at any time, that we are to be looking diligently for that time. So what are we supposed to do while we wait for him? We're to prepare. We're, we're like the bride who's looking forward to the wedding day and, and understanding that we've got to get ready. How do we get ready? By sanctification, by becoming more holy, by being purified. It's interesting that in real life, it's kind of the opposite in a sense. You start out as chaste, and from that point, you kind of lose that chasteness, that purity. In 
terms of the gospel, we are rebellious, we are uh, wicked, we are evil, and God wants to take us from that point and make us more chaste. He wants to uh, reverse in us the pattern of iniquity. He wants, us to, he wants to make us clean. He wants to make us a prepared bride fitting for Jesus Christ who was without sin. That we would adorn ourselves not in wickedness or evilness, but we would be adorned in righteousness. Look with me at verse number 24. It says there, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. This is our calling that we would be being sanctified. We oftentimes think of calling in terms of a call to the ministry and uh, for those that are pastors or missionaries. But all of us, if we've been born again, all of us, if we are children of God, have received a calling in our lives. We have a calling to live a holy life, to live a sanctified life for the Lord Jesus Christ. When you look at calling, there's several, kind of two major aspects of it in Scripture. Uh, The first idea of calling has to do with identity. It's it's a name. If you remember, uh, sometimes referring to Jesus, it says, and his name shall be called. This would be his identity, that calling has to do with who he is. Then there's also an expectation that can come with the calling. Based on your identity, there becomes expectations with that identity. That's why as a called preacher or someone who shares the gospel as a pastor or a missionary, someone who has the calling of the ministry upon their life, that comes with an expectation. We all have received a calling. We have been called by God if we have been saved to a specific expectation. And that calling has to do with how we behave. It has to do with what God is doing in our lives. We saw in chapter number 2 of 1 Thessalonians, verse number 12, it says that that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. We've been called to be citizens of his kingdom, to live for not our own self, but for his glory. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. In this calling is the idea that we would live a specific life, a holy life, a clean life for him. First Peter says this, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because we are children of God who is a holy God, because he is the one who has called us, we therefore are to be holy in all manner of conversation. He says in 1 Peter 2, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We all have a calling from the Lord. I think it is evident that some believers, either one, do not understand the work that God is doing to change them, or they simply do not care. God is always working his plan to change us, to sanctify us, to make us more holy. If we are not seeing change in our lives, it's not because God has taken a time out. It's not because he went on vacation. It's not because he's fallen asleep at the wheel. We read there in verse number 24, it says, faithful is he who hath called you. God is faithful. He does his job without fail. He doesn't get tired. He doesn't need a break. He will do it, it says. What does that mean? Well, here is, first of all, let me give you this blessing part. Notice it says there in verse number 24, in reference to our sanctification, in reference to making us more holy, in reference to the change that desperately needs to take place in us of shedding off the old man and putting on the new man, it says, in verse 24, that he will do it. He will do it. What is the idea? What does this mean? Well, we understand God is sovereign. What that means is that God can do anything. God is not limited in any way. Nothing can stop him. God is the one being in the universe who can do whatever he desires. However, God has allowed man to have volition or free will. 
God can do whatever he wants, but he allows men to make choices on their own. He leads, he guides, he speaks, he prods, he draws, but he doesn't force us to submit to his plan. So what does it mean here then that he will do it? If he does what he, he does what he does faithfully, he guides and leads and prods and he draws us, he does all of these things faithfully, but what does it mean that he will do it in terms of us having free will? What it means is that he gives us the desire and the ability to do his will. Think with me about this verse, Philippians chapter number two and verse number 13, it says this. For it is God which worketh in you, that word worketh is the word energio. It's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God, who is faithful, will be working in us. He will do that faithfully, consistently. He is always working in us, what? Both to will and to do. There's two parts of that. He gives us the desire. He works in us to will he, that's the idea of he gives us the desire, the motivation to do, and then he, he, he works in us to do. He equips us, he enables us, he empowers us to do his will. What is God working? What is he doing in us? He's giving us the desire to perform his will, to make these changes, to be sanctified, and he's enabling us to make these changes. That's what God is doing. That is him doing his faithful part to work the change in us that he wants to see according to his will. The change that needs to take place in you, God can do it. He can give the desire and the enabling you need to obey whatever it is that he asks of you. This is how he gets the glory for the good that is in you. If he is the one motivating, if he is the one enabling, then he is the one that is doing it. Now, that is a huge blessing to us. See, God doesn't, when we get saved, say, okay, hand, I'm going to hand you a huge list of things, and now I want you to go and do your best and discipline yourself and, and give your best effort to try to make those changes. No, God is working in us to make these changes possible. If you say, I'm going to go out on my own, and I can, I can handle this, I can uh, work my life the way that it should be, and I can do everything that God wants me to do on my own, you will desperately fail. But the good news is, is God doesn't expect that of you. God is working in you already. He is giving you the motivation. He is uh, uh, working in you to will, to give you what you need to want to make those changes. And he's giving you the opportunity, the way, the uh, means to do it. That frees you from this great burden of needing to change yourself. Verse 24 is a wonderful blessing for us understanding that the one who has called us, the one who has placed before us this sanctified life is the one who is saying, hey, I will do this in you. It's not up to you to do it on your own. I am the one who will change you. God wants to change us. He wants to sanctify us. He wants to prepare us to be holy and blameless for when we are presented to Jesus Christ. So the question is then, what do we do? If God does it, do we just kind of kick it into autopilot and say, okay, you're going to do it. I, that frees my hands from doing anything. Well, obviously we understand that's not the case, right? There's, there's surely some part that we play in it. That's where verse number 19 through verse number 22 come into play. This is what it's all about. God is going to faithfully do his part so he can see change happen in us. But ultimately, and, and ultimately we know that his plan will be successful. But there are some considerations that we must look at to see if we are cooperating with what God is working in us. God is faithfully going to work in us the change that needs to take place. But are we doing what we can to cooperate with that work that he's doing? Look with me in verse number 19. How can we cooperate? How can we uh, enable this change that needs to take place happening in our lives? Well, first of all, verse number 19, quench not the spirit. And we're still in this phase of the book where Paul's kind of given us one-liners in a sense. He's given up very, very simple things. Now we understand the overall purpose he has. And he says right here, if you need to, if you're, in order for this change to take place, in order for God's working in you to be successful, number one, quench not the spirit. 
That idea of quenching is to extinguish as a fire. Throughout Scripture, several places we understand the Holy Spirit is referenced as this idea of fire. Matthew chapter number 3 and verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Acts chapter number 2, we looked at this a couple weeks ago. Verse number 3, And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them as they were filled with the Holy Ghost. And, began to, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Spirit is in us as a fire. The Holy Spirit is the fire for the Christian life. We are to be filled. We are to be, that's the idea of to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. It is to be working like a, a mighty forest fire that is spreading rapidly, that is uh, consuming things, and, and it is out of control. The Spirit is to control us. We're to be filled with it. And Ephesians talks about that idea of be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean? It's to, to have influence over us. We're to be at its control. What we see in Scripture is where there is opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work. When the Holy Spirit is not quenched, it produces power, as we see in Acts chapter number 2. There is a spiritual magnitude that is not easily overcome. There is a fervor that is supernatural. When the Holy Spirit is given free reign to do its job, to run its course, to accomplish what it desires to accomplish in our lives. When we are not quenching it, when we are not putting it out, it produces power in our lives. But the Holy Spirit also, when it's not quenched, produces liberty. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse 17 says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The Spirit gives us freedom. It, it, it breaks us free from that bondage of sin. It, it breaks us free and gives us liberty to do what God would have us to do. Really, in today's day, there are two extremes about the Holy Spirit. There is, number one, either a cold indifference or, two, a wild excess. There's those who don't believe in the cessation of spiritual gifts and uh, are claiming them, and in some ways they are going crazy with these holy, uh, supposed Holy Spirit-led uh, gifts. But on the other side, it can be fairly easy to simply forget and not even think about the need of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So what quenches the Spirit? How do we put the fire out of the Holy Spirit in our lives? It's really the idea of resistance. When the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding us and we resist, then we are quenching the working of the Holy Spirit. The fire is meant to motivate us. It's meant to enable us for the work of the ministry. It's meant to give us the power to change our lives for the glory of God. But what happens when we don't want to go in that direction that the Spirit is leading us? When we don't want to deny ourselves of that sin? Or we don't want to take that step of faith. We do what we always do with fire that is out of control. We quench it. We pour water on it. We stomp it. We throw a blanket over it to rob of, it, of its oxygen. That fire that's getting out of control, we do something to contain it. Those of you that have children can relate with this. Sometimes when you take your kids to a place that's supposed to be quiet, maybe the library, Maybe it's church. And there's times where they're supposed to be quiet, but they don't understand the parameters here. You have to say, what do you do? When they start to speak up, when their volume starts to get too loud, you shush them. You say, shh, quiet down, right? We use our quiet voices right now in here. And we quiet them down. Sometimes that's what we do with the Holy Spirit in our lives. When it's working and it's speaking, but we don't want to make too much commotion in this world of wickedness. We shush it down. The, the world that is around us is the opposite of sanctification, but when we don't want to ruffle feathers, when we don't want to be singled out, when we don't want to be labeled, 
as a Bible thumper or a Jesus freak or whatever, what we do then is we kind of quiet down the spirit. Sometimes we're going along and we're doing just fine and there it is. There's that Holy Spirit starting to flare up a little bit. It's, you know, maybe we're with a coworker or someone that we know is not saved and it's just us and we have opportunity and the Holy Spirit starts to flame up and say, I want you to speak of me. And we go, whoa, let's quiet that down. We quench it. Maybe the Holy Spirit says to us, go give that person a track over there that, with the gospel and, you know, the inconvenience of it or the embarrassment of it. We say, whoa. And we shush it down. We quench the spirit. Maybe as we're got that TV show on and maybe that content that's not real godly is showing and the Holy Spirit says, whoa, this needs to be dealt with. And we go, no, no, shh. He's quiet down there. We, and we quench the spirit. Maybe we're driving and have the radio on and there's that song that comes on and the Spirit says, oh, maybe you shouldn't be listening to that. Change the station. And there we are just going, oh, shh. Quiet down, Spirit. And we quench the Spirit of God. Eventually what happens is we turn down the volume of the Spirit so much that we can't hear it anymore. The truth is, is we're not changing because we can't remember the last time that God spoke to us and we heard His voice. Can't remember that sensing of conviction in our lives. We've quenched the spirit and now our soul is no longer hearing it. The fire has gone down to a few embers in the dark. And in the meantime, we don't have life change. We don't have power and we don't have liberty. So if this working of God for sanctification is going to happen in our lives, we've got to not be quenching the spirit of God. That is what is going to enable this power for change in our lives. But then notice, secondly, not only do we not quench the Spirit, in verse number 20, we do not want to despise prophesying. Prophesying. The idea of prophesying here is in the early church, it was directly inspired instruction. It was exhortation. It was warning. The prophets would receive truth into their own spirit that was withdrawn from earthly things. It was concentrated upon the spiritual world. This is before the New Testament was completed. And the gift of prophecy was a temporary phenomenon that would take place. Like the gift of tongues that we read about and the other sign gifts, God would give direct utterance of truth by means of his Holy Spirit. He would give inspiration and illumination to an individual in, his, in the church that, that, that would serve the purpose of, of edification. Now that we have the New Testament complete, a direct prophetic utterance and the gift of the prophet have ceased. Now this is, my, this is my opinion, this is what I believe to be biblical, that the gift of prophecy has ceased. The prophets were necessary to make truth available to scattered con- congregations before the New Testament was recorded and then began being circulated. What happened is, is that when the New Testament became complete and those letters that God had given to us to be instruction for the New Testament church, when they began to be circulated to the churches, there was no longer a need for prophecy. 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 and verse number 8, it says this, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So the idea is that eventually these gifts, these sign gifts would become obsolete. When the New Testament was complete and then that could be translated into different languages, then the sign gift of tongues wasn't necessarily needed anymore. I'm not saying God can't work through speaking of tongues. Those that are missionaries wish that he would at times. But the fact is, is that we have uh, the word of God preserved for us that we can translate into all these languages. And and when it comes to this idea of prophecy, turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. Hold your place here. We'll come back to uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, we understand that this isn't so much the idea of prophesying future events. Uh, It's not apocalyptic Uh, writings or literature that we're talking about here. 
It was the idea of God speaking through, through individuals in the church and giving them truth because they didn't have the word of God preserved for them that they could circulate. 1 Corinthians chapter number 14, look with me there at verse number 1. It says, Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophecy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesy. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. So we see the purpose of this prophesying was what? For edification, for exhortation, for comfort. Where do we get that now? We get it from the scriptures. But before they had the scriptures, men would prophesy, they would speak truth that would, that would enable them to have what they need to live a godly life. It was the presence of false prophets in the early church that made this exercise of this gift somewhat suspect. Because there were false prophets going around, there was uh, maybe this tendency to question whether what they were hearing was in truth the word of God. Now, its place in our day has been taken by preaching, through biblical preaching. The New Testament prophet received his message through direct illumination. We don't do that anymore. Now we have the message from the preserved scriptures. But what we can understand is the challenge here to despise not prophesying had to do with their response, their attitude toward receiving truth for their lives. And he says there to despise not prophesying. That word despise has to do with to regard as nothing, to treat with contempt. Oftentimes we when we're looking at studying scripture and this word despise, every other time it's used, it's used to refer to individuals. You despise people. You consider people of little worth. You regard individuals as nothing. But it is possible to come to the point where our view of the word of God is the same. Like that person that drives you nuts that you would rather not be around. That when they begin to speak, what happens? You say, I'm going to tune them out. Why? Because I despise them. I don't, I don't care what they have to say. I'm not interested in the words coming out of their mouth, right? And we understand that to a person when we, we kind of were contemptible. I don't know if that's the right context of that. But we have contempt for this person and it impacts how we receive them and what they have to say. We reject them. We tune it out. So when we're talking about despising prophesying or despising the word of God, it's where we get to a point where we hold it of little value. Where the word of God, we kind of just tune it out. We reject it. Ephesians 5, if you remember, we talked about there, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it by what? By the watering or washing of water by the word. The word of God is essential for our sanctification. The word of God is the medium that he uses to cleanse us. Uh, Jesus was the standard when he walked on earth. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Jesus was the manifestation of truth. But when Jesus ascended back to heaven, the question is then what serves as our example? What is the manifestation of truth? What is the example of how we are to live a holy and pure and righteous life? Well, we have the word of God preserved for us. Jesus ascended, but his word, his holy standard, his words that represent him, we still have. We can't hear Christ audibly, but we do have his words preserved for us. And when we despise his words, we begin to see them as contemptible. We begin to see them as little worth. When we do so, we cut off the means to our sanctification. When we tune our ears out and refuse to hear the word of God, then we have eliminated the medium in which God uses to change us. We, we stop the change that God wants to work in us. We don't want to come to the point where we're like the nation of Israel, where we have the word of God in our hands, but we despise it. 
Jeremiah chapter number 6 and verse number 10, it says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach, and they have no delight in it. They had the word of God, but when the prophets would speak, they saw the word as a reproach. They had zero delight in it. But that's the opposite of David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, isn't it? Who said, More, moreover to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. He delighted in the word of God. But not this point where Jeremiah was preaching to him that they said, the word of the Lord, it's a reproach. Zechariah chapter number 7 and verse number 12, it says, Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came great wrath from the Lord of hosts. They made their heart as an adamant stone. They would not hear the law. Proverbs chapter number 1, it talks about they, 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 they covered their ears from hearing. We might think of those that despise the word as those who would just outright reject the inspiration of Scripture or deny the inerrancy of Scripture. The people who spend their time finding ways to tear it down. In our context, though, of what we're reading tonight, we're talking about God's people and the need for change. And and that we have to have the word of God in order to change. But when we come to the point where we despise the word of God, when it has little worth to us, when it's a reproach, who when they hear it, our hearts, when we hear the word of God, our heart has become like stone. That we may hear it, we may turn to the reference, we may recognize that that's what pastor preached, but our hearts are not impacted because we have tuned it out. I wonder, when it comes to the word of God, Is there a certain topic? Is there a certain subject that when you hear that subject about this from the scriptures, you just turn it out? Maybe the idea of money comes up and you say, well, not interested in what that has to say. Maybe it has to do with some type of dress. Maybe some entertainment in could be a multitude of different things and individually we all know where there's that one area that boy if that area is touched on or we read it in our devotions we kind of just glance over because we just we're not interested in yielding power to that scripture in submission to that scripture and we've just turned it out we tuned it out we'd rather doodle on paper or check our phone than listen to that teaching listen to the truth But if we're going to have change take place in our lives, we can't despise the Word of God. We can't despise prophesying. We've got to allow the Word of God to run free course in our lives. We've got to keep our ears open and our hearts tender rather than like stone. And then notice with me number three, we see in verse number 21, this challenge that says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That word prove isn't the idea that you're going to show someone. It's the idea to test, to examine, to prove, to scrutinize, to see if something is genuine or not. It's the idea of the refining of metals, to see if they are pure, to see if they are right. And what we understand that verse number 21 is telling us is that we must have discernment between what is good and what is evil. We need discernment to know whether something is right or whether something is wrong. Romans chapter number 12, verse number 2, I'm sure most of us in here could quote this verse. It says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may what? Say it out loud with me. That ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Proving there is not saying that we are going to show everyone what is good. It's saying that we may test, that we may examine that which is good, that which is perfect, that we would have discernment of what the will of God is. 
And we must understand that the world around us wants to redefine what is good and what is evil. Isaiah 5, verse 20, it talks about this. It says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. The world around us that is wicked wants to define what is good and what is evil. And when Paul is challenging them to prove all things, he's making it clear you've got to have discernment between what is good and what is evil. There's a lot of application that I'm kind of tempted to veer off a little bit here because this principle is is a really good one for all aspects of our life. Before you promote some ideal, before you promote uh, post something on Facebook, before you quickly accept or outright reject some thought, you should do your due diligence. You should prove all things. You need to have discernment. Our world rejects the idea of truth. We live in a postmodern society. What does that mean? It means that they say truth does not exist. Instead, there are meta narratives that determine a culture's ideals. What that means is that society does not operate on facts, but they make up the facts to fit the desired narrative for the people. Before you feel pressured by society to act or say a certain thing, you had better not just take their word for it. You better actually prove all things. You better do some research and find out the truth. And don't just trust one source on the internet, okay? Do due diligence so you can have discernment of what's right and what's wrong. Now, let me jump back into our context, okay? Uh, in this idea of personal change, our sanctification. We must be wise and discerning in our lives what needs to go and what needs to stay. We need discernment of what we need to add and what we need to let go of. We need to understand what is good and acceptable. We need to know what is God's will for our lives. And there are two specific tools that he has given the New Testament believer to help us have discernment. I'm going to, let's, let's be a little proactive. I know folks are at home. God has given us two specific things to the New Testament believer to help us to have discernment. Help me out. What would those two things be? Raise your hands. Michelle? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, number one. What's the other thing? The Word of God, right? It's almost so obvious, right? So building on what Paul has just said, Quench not the spirit. Why? You need that for discernment. Don't despise prophesying. Don't despise the word of God. Why? Because that's necessary for discernment between good and evil. The Bible and the Holy Spirit are what helps us to determine this needs to go. This needs to leave my life. This needs to be added to my life. Hebrews chapter number four and verse number 12, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. How do we prove all things? Well, first of all, we start with asking, what does the word of God have to say about this? I don't look and say, what, is, what do my friends think about this? Uh, what does society think about this as a whole? No, we think, what does God say about this in his word? That's how we prove all things. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. We don't have the answer for every single thing. But almost anything we face in life, it's not the first time that someone has faced those things. And God gives us instruction in Scripture so that we may prove all things, so that we may examine, so that we may know the difference between good and evil. John chapter number 16 and verse 13, Jesus speaking about the Holy Spirit. says, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak and will show you things to come. The Spirit, Jesus says, I'm going to go away and the Comforter will come and he will guide you in truth. God gave us his word and God gives us his Spirit so that they will speak to us and help us prove all things so that we may discern between what is good and what is evil. Now look with me here in our verses. 
Verse 21, prove all things. So examine all things. Determine what is evil. Determine what is good. Then he says this, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. In verse 22, here here is what I've been taught that verse 22 means. You need to be concerned about the impression that you give to people. You don't want them to mistake your good intentions or something good you're doing and mistake it as evil. I've been in churches where you don't go to the movie theater because that might be giving the appearance of evil. Now, maybe there's some good principles there, but that's not necessarily what it's saying. Verse 22 is not on an island all itself. When we understand the context, he's talking about examining, proving all things. Determine, discernment, what, between what is good and what is evil. When you understand that which is the will of God, when you understand what is good in life, then he says, hold fast to those things. Those are things that you need to hold tightly. Those are things that you need to grip a hold of because that is my will. That is what's good. That is what is acceptable for your life. But, verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. When You are proving all things, and the clear appearance of something is that it is evil. Abstain from that. Don't 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 go with that. Don't uh, the idea is to participate in that. We saw in in, in chapter number four where he says uh, it's the will of God, even your sanctification, that you abstain from fleshly lust. You don't have anything to do with that. Get away from that. So when something appears to be evil, as we are discerning what the Lord would have us to do, if it's good, we need to hold tightly to it. We need to hold steadfastly. If it's evil and it appears to be evil, we need to abstain from that. As we practice this in our lives, think of the change that takes place, right? Those evil things as the word of God and the spirit of God uh, speak to us and say, that is evil. Don't do that. And we examine that and we say, okay, this is evil. I need, and we then cast it aside. We abstain. But then when we read the scriptures and the Holy Spirit confirms in our heart, hey, this is a good thing. You're on the right path. Keep doing this. Then we hold tightly to that. And we continue to walk in that way. Why? Because God says that that's what's good. So we've got to prove all of these things. And as we do that, as God shows us what needs to go, and he shows us what needs to, that we need to hold on tightly to, then, then he's changing our lives. He's making us holy. He's making us more like his son. Normally, there's a job around the house that I do, but sometimes I delegate it to Timothy and he helps me out. And that's to go clean the backyard and to scoop the dog dew. And uh, it's important before I mow the yard, I care deeply about my yard, and I want to make sure that I'm not running any over any dog dew. And so as Timmy does the job, he does a pretty good job, but inevitably, when he's done, I've got to say, son, come back outside and we'll walk the yard and we'll find some doo-doo that was missed. And Timmy will go, oh, I didn't, I didn't see that. He, obviously, he didn't see it or he would have picked it up, right? It wasn't, wasn't revealed to him. But nevertheless, that, that doo-doo's got to go. Maybe you didn't see it, but it's still there. And it still needs to be cleaned up. I know it's kind of a crude example, but listen. As the Holy Spirit of God speaks to us and convicts us and says, hey, there's some, there's some evil here that needs to go. It's probably something we may say, you know, I didn't see that before. I didn't know that was there. I didn't know that that was evil. But now I see it was evil. And we say, okay, that's got to go. We abstain then from it. That is how God changes us. That is how he removes the sin and wickedness from our lives. And that's the process by which he purifies us and makes us clean. He gives us his word and he gives us his spirit so that we may prove, examine, is this good or is this evil? Now, we've got to be careful because we live in a world who completely paints a different picture about what is evil than what God says in his book. Young people, listen to me. The world will say, There's physical interaction between a man and a woman that's completely normal before marriage. That's not what God says in his book. To them, that's not evil at all. God says it is. 
there's a lot of other activities and, and, and examples that we could give where, look, at the whole world says, no problem with this. Our culture, right? Don't judge us. Who are you to say what's right? It's not me saying it. It's God saying it. He says that that's evil. And when we discern what God says is evil, we abstain from that. So my question tonight is this. What is God showing you through his word and through his spirit that needs to go in your life? That you need to stop neglecting. He is faithful. But if you're not hearing what he has to tell you, then you need to humble your heart and recognize that the spirit has been quenched. When have you resisted that nudging of his spirit to your spirit? Let me ask you, how is your relationship with the Word of God? Some people, I wonder, after years of preaching, if God's ever done anything in their heart. If there's been any time they've walked away from a message thinking, boy, God God did something to me there. How's your relationship to the Word of God? Do you come, but your ears are not really open? When was the last time you felt the Spirit of God telling, I need to change this in you? And you didn't walk out and say, nope, I'm not going to do anything about that, but you responded to it. We need to change. It's God's will that we change. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this passage of Scripture that challenges us. Really, Lord, as we wrap up the whole book of 1 Thessalonians, thank you for the truths that you've taught us. I pray that you'd help us to be faithful, um, to obey your word, help us as a church to be concerned, Lord, about that which is good and that which is evil. Help us to... Uh, paint the right picture according to scripture. Help us to prove all things. Lord, I pray that the spirit would not be quenched here, but God, there'd be a tender spirit that our hearts would be open to what you want to accomplish through us. God, help us not out of inconvenience or embarrassment quench your spirit. God, may it be a fire in our hearts and in our congregation, Lord, in our families, that it would just be spreading like wildfire and be powerful and give us liberty that we'd be experiencing fullness of joy. God, help us to love your book. Help us to just cherish it, Lord. Help us to uh, just submit to its authority. Help us to have discernment, Lord, that we would understand what's good and what's evil. And I pray, Lord, you just accomplish what you want in each of our lives. Help us to be tenderhearted so that you can change us, so that you can fashion us the way that you want us to be fashioned. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for coming tonight. Thanks for those who have tuned in via Facebook. And uh, I hope that, that it was a blessing and a shot, a spiritual shot in the arm to you. And we'll look forward to our service Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. We'll be back here. And I hope that you'll join us and be a part of that service. I'm going to, before I close, just ask if there's some, some prayer requests here of some folks uh, that are with us. And see if there's anything that we could pray or lift up um, to the Lord as we're closed. Anybody got a prayer request tonight? All right. Everyone is doing well. All right, Craig, would you lift your voice up and dismiss us in prayer? And then we will be dismissed.